for me, it's like psychologically for society, art is extremely important. I think it's beneficent to the holistic welfare of a society. Thurston Moore has never been shy about entwining his political beliefs with his artistic output. As one of the preeminent guitarists to rise out of New York's punk scene in the early 80s, Moore has spent his entire career resisting the capitalist pressures of the music industry, choosing instead to push artistic and political boundaries, challenging the status quo, and helping to build a thriving alternative rock scene. His experiments with noise made him an underground icon and a key influence on the grunge that took over airwaves in the 90s. In Sonic Youth, Moore channeled his beliefs into magnificent pieces of political outrage, like Youth Against Fascism, a song whose message feels more relevant than ever today. But what does an artist whose career was so tied to the idea of youthful rebellion do when they grow up? An old adage claims that people become more conservative as they age, and there are plenty of one-time punks who have made a case for the veracity of that statement, but Moore isn't one of them. A few weeks back, I had the privilege of speaking with Thurston Moore about his latest solo album, Flow Critical Lucidity. What I found was a man who, despite being in his mid-60s, was enthusiastically embracing the protest and resistance of a new generation of youth. I love the word woke. Yeah, you know, be woke, you know, because yeah. I, that, that's such a demonized phrase right now within the culture, especially in temporary culture, where you sort of have more sort of right wing thinkers wanting to sort of take that word away. When I first heard that word during the Black Lives Matter resistance, I just thought it was great. What a great word, you know, to be woke, to be alert, to be aware, which I really sort of was like was an idea coming out of like the teenage culture of hardcore in the early 80s, this idea of pro-awareness and responsibility and dignity to your own culture. Like so many of us, Moore has been keeping an eye on our strange political moment, watching the election cycle in America play out from his new home of London. It's curious to see where we are right now as the, the shift in the political landscape and, the, and what our governance is. This year is very critical, so it's interesting watching it. I actually wanted to go in the studio the other day and, and record a song called uh, Now I Want to Eat Your Dog. I, I, I think I missed my, my chance. For all this political consciousness, Moore believes in keeping a degree of abstraction when he engages politically in his music. I think different writers, different composers, different artists have their own personal articulation of what their work is in relation to engaging with the socio-political spectrum. It, as soon as you're sort of having an exchange with a certain strata of society, there is this responsibility of language. And so I, I understand that. And knowing that I don't really have a political articulation that I feel like I can really expound upon publicly, like say like Jello Biafra or something. Yeah, just, yeah. Like, just on it. And uh, I'm not, I'm not that. But you know, I think about Fagazi, like somebody like Ian Mackay, who I always thought had a very sort of like personalized sort of political perspective of like how to sort of conduct yourself as a young person in the world, and being a model for that for so many young young people. And he's really special in that way. And so when I look at Fugazi lyrics, it's like, but I don't really sort of see that happening lyrically, even though it is couched in there in a very abstracted way. I really like the lyrics, but they can, they evoke just about anything that the listener yeah. might want to bring to it. And I also like that too. I like the, I like the power of, of writing where it allows the reader or the listener to be intrigued and it sparks the imagination. And you can use that work to be this evocation for your own stuff. This more obscure approach to writing can be felt throughout Flow Critical Lucidity. The lyrics are filled with reflections of youth pulled from Moore's own experience. The opening track, New in Town, is a punk love story that name drops many of the great 80s hardcore bands. Minor threats, teen idol vibe. Freedom springs, let them inside. My brain's right, see a youth brigade. G.I.'s Fugazi here to stay. We're high on your energy. Straight edge library, go boy slam into me, boy go slam into me. Other pieces like the ominous chugging shadow carry a lingering darkness with hazy lyrics that feel like a half-remembered nightmare. Concrete and whiskey, the neon psych, Michigan mothership, negative night. It's never happening. Moore wrote
wrote most of Flo Critical Lucidity's lyrics alongside his wife, who writes under the pen name Radio Radio. She'll tend to be a little more into having lines that sort of deal with the very political situations that we are all sort of engaged in these days, more so than I do or I have. This might seem like an odd statement from the man who sang Youth Against Fascism, but Moore said that even the writing process of that song was different than you might think. Even that was sort of, for me, was like having fun with language where it was like such a direct, if not banal, phrase. I saw it like in a, in a counterculture newspaper, like Youth Against Fascism. I was like, that's kind of cool. Just like, just the alliteration of that line. It's like, it's not something I would really use in my work because I tend towards experimental prosaic of verbiage, but I just liked it for that matter that it was actually very extremely direct. So it was all about the artfulness of that phrase and writing lyrics that would sort of a jibe with that, you know? I think the clearest theme to be found on flow critical lucidity is that of nature. So many of the lyrics are filled with vivid, naturalistic imagery. This imagery was inspired by an artist's residence that Moore took in Switzerland when working on the album. And it just happened to be like, you know, in the back was Lake Geneva and the Alps, and there was all this kind of energy from the natural world. It put me into this place of contemplation as exactly at a time when there was so much crisis going on with the natural world sort of being very disturbed and, and yeah. to the point where uh, the weather patterns were becoming more disturbed. And just thinking about like how that relationship that any life force on the earth has with the essence of nature, which keeps us going from one day to the next. Without that, we all, we all vanish. You know. Often when people think about naturalistic sound palettes, they think acoustic guitars and flutes, music that's lush and warm. But the reality is that all of us are an extension of nature, and the screeching noise of an electric guitar is just as representative of the awe-inspiring power of our planet, and of the terror that can come when we're put at its mercy. There's a song on the record called The Diver, which is an incident that happened while I was there where a diver was doing exploratory work in the lake, and he disappeared, and they, and they found him a few days later. And But I was there when it was happening, and watching the police dredge the lake and finally finding this body and he was that's basically what he was doing and he succumbed to being overwhelmed by like that energy in that lake they found your watercolors and your field nuts pen, both in bluegills beauty and the sound you cup to grayling into your hand sonics of nature, of geology, and the earth itself makes the sound of my guitar going through an amp sound like Mary Poppins. <laughs> <laughs> The ominous doom of Moore's noise is more than just a representation of the Earth's power for me. When I listened to the album, I found that this heavy dread resonated with the ongoing dread that I and many others feel every day thinking about the current state of our planet. If there's any responsibility as an artist right now, it's a responsibility to uh, acknowledge our relationship with the Earth first. So that's what kind of what's going on thematically with this record. Mountain meadows are the shrines. This theme wasn't something that came about deliberately, but rather a natural result of the influences around Moore as he worked on the album. It's like, you know, it kind of defines itself as it's being constructed. I don't hardly ever go into making a record with some thematic concept. I mean, it's always defined by the vagaries of daily life. And, and I try to be really respectful of that. That's a shared experience that we all have. It's just like living in this situation that we think we have some control over, but we don't. For all the philosophical ideas that go behind the creation of the record, Moore also has a clear workmanlike approach to his process. I think about like making a record like it's like it's like I'm going to work with tools and you know making something and and I'm making it as this ephemeral document that is all about just communication and sharing and sort of like the idea of enhancement of 
of just sort of this intellectual exchange, you know. In the modern age, that process has become more ephemeral than ever with the ability to share music online. And Moore is no Luddite. He celebrates the online world and gushed about Bandcamp as a platform, saying their Bandcamp Friday initiative dignified musicians in a way few in the industry did. But that doesn't mean he thinks artists should go fully digital. Do both if you can, because, you know, you have this like privilege of of exchanging your music, whether free or naming your own price for whatever revenue you want online. So I always suggest that, you know, work in that realm. It's fine. I mean, it doesn't have the um, vibratory or tangibility of, of actually making the physical gift of a, of a record or a book or a fanzine or whatever. I said, make that too, if you can. If make it and don't expect to even break even or make profit off of it. Initially make it as, as, as a gift item. I think people respond really a lot to the, the physicality of your work. If you can touch them, you have them sort of touch something. I like this story that I had heard about Sun Ra, you know, where when he was going on tour in Egypt and he had asked the promoter to send over some fabric from where they were touring. And the promoter asked why, he was like, why do you want me to do that? He says, because I want to feel the vibrations of where I'm going. So I'm prepared, you know, I mean, it's completely esoteric as Sun Ra was want to be, but in some ways it's beautiful. And it really makes a lot of sense. The idea of like touching and smelling, you know, the, the actual senses of the, of the human condition, you know, listening to a record at this point in my life, I feel like I've decoded the vocabulary of, of whatever rock and soul music to such an extent that like playing the record is kind of the last thing on my mind. I'm kind of more into like just touching and holding the record and looking at it and, you know, this kind of sensation smelling the record, you know, uh, just like I knew a record dealer in Japan who could smell where a record was manufactured. He would take the record out of the sleeve and he would smell it and go like, oh, yes. <laughs> Yugoslavia pressing, you know. <laughs> I had a lot of questions for Moore about the modern state of music, and while he was quick to point out many of the problematic practices by platforms like Spotify, he had a generally optimistic view about the future of music and the youth of the digital age. I find it really interesting talking to a 15-year-old today who is a, very aware of new voices coming up in any place on the globe and seeing that as their own local world. That's not the only thing that Moore loves about today's youth. Whether because of broader networks of distribution or because of the unique times we live in, more and more young people are experimenting with noise music. Noise scenes have become some of the most exciting music in our modern age, and that's nothing short of a delight for Moore, who pioneered much of this ethos when he was barely an adult himself. For me, I had never, I would have never thought about being in my mid 60s and having uh people in their late teens and early 20s come up to you and and just like you know that they're into that aspect of what you do more so than anything they don't they're not talking about songs per se they're talking about what you do with like a file behind the 12th fret of a guitar yeah i remember going on tour with michael chapman who was who is no longer alive but he was a great folk blues guitarist here in england i asked him to like do a duo with me at the end of our sets at the end of the night in these pubs that we were playing all through england and so at the end of the night we would come out on stage the two of us or i would join him at the end of his set and we'd plug in and, and immediately i would sort of create some kind of feedback music coming out of the, the amplifier with the acoustic guitar and i always remember the first night we did it there were some young people in the front and one kid just went yes <laughs> <laughs> and it was that yes i was like he must have been 19 years old that was a dream come true for him after listening to this music and you know and being appreciative but then hearing just this this shred of feedback coming out of an amp with you know using like a metal like implement against the strings and just that delighted, yes. Nearly 50 years into his musical career, Thurston Moore remains one of the most interesting guitarists working today. He continues to play things wild and loud and continues to believe in the social, political, and metaphysical power of noise. It's liberating. It's just like, you know that it, it can like go anywhere. It's surprising. I think it's just the joy of its iconoclastic nature, you know, as, as noise. 
and what you can do with it. You can check out his latest album, Flow Critical Lucidity, now. And if you want to check out my entire interview with Thurston Moore, you can head on over to Nebula, where I've posted the full conversation. There's some neat tidbits that didn't make it into this cut, and, and I just think it's really great. So head on over to Nebula to check that out, and hey, thanks for watching.